What's up? What's up, everybody? It's your boy Lil Donnie from the Wild Bunch. Make sure you go get my book, Wild Bunch, The Dimensions of a Brownsville Millionaire, out now on Amazon. And make sure you subscribe, like, share. You know, we try to get the real. We try to keep it 100 with everybody. I thank everybody for the support. Make sure you go get those Wild Bunch masks. Everything is on shop. If I got the Wild Bunch hats, the Wild Bunch shirt, let me know what state you're from. I personalize the state for you. Today's story, like I said, I've been talking about like from a, 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 a inmate's point of view, a prisoner's point of view on how, you know, inside a prison, you know, things are not always what they seem to be. And it's really hard because it's a negative situation when you're in there that you find yourself in. It's kind of hard to be positive. You know, most of the dudes that get in there and they get into the mind state of they got my body, but they don't got my mind is usually the ones that get out and kind of make the transition to be back in society and be productive because you know, being productive citizen in society is is for your family. It's, it's to help be there for your family. And, you know, when your daughter get married and when your kid go to graduation, you miss a lot of that stuff. But what I'm trying to do today, I want to talk to an officer. I want to talk to a CO and see their point of view, preferably a female CO point of view. Because, you know, I see some stuff about that out there and I wanted to act. So I reached out to a couple. Let's make some calls. You know, you know, let's make some calls and see who we could get on the line that been in the been in the trenches and could tell us something. You know, let's make a call. Here we go. Hello. How you doing? This little Donnie. Hi, honey. How are you? Oh, man. How you been doing? I'm good. No complaints. No complaints. Nice to meet you. Oh, okay. Nice to meet you, too. I heard you, um, you're retired from corrections? No, not retired. I left. Oh, you left corrections? Mm-hmm. Can I ask why? Well, I left because uh, they said that I went to visit an inmate while I was at work. Wow. <laughs> so when you say went to visit, you mean he was in his cell? No. They said that I went to state New York to a state prison to visit an inmate while I was literally at work, um, you know, at work. Oh, Okay. Basically, it really boiled down to uh, one of the depths was um, unbeknownst to most of us. He has with his son, and um, I don't know what happened. I don't know if the son got a hold of his firearm. I don't know. Something happened with the son, and they were trying to um, force him to, you know, retire. And basically, I guess in his mind, uh, let him get um, try to railroad to catch somebody. You know, nice little case. You know, catch that officer doing a wrong. You know, doing something wrong, and um, use me as his as his scapegoat basically. And um, yeah. And I went through the whole process, the whole you know, uh, shebang. And at the end of the day, normally when something like that happens, there's a you know basically there's a trial. Um, it's called oaths. And um, I'm going back and forth to oaths. You know. Um, fighting the case or whatever, and normally it's the panel who decides what happens. And in this case, um, they told me that my my particular case was going to be heard by the commissioner herself, which at the time was unheard of. Like what the commissioner? So I knew that I wasn't going to allow my career to be, you know, decided upon one person's opinion of me just by what they see on paper. So I chose to resign. And what I did was, you know, I wrote up, you know, wrote it up in terms of, you know, with the lawyer, of course, you know, my uh, my stipulations and when I would tie it, you know, and I did it strategically because I knew that, you know, after a certain date, you get out, 
our um, our bank of time, you know, our vacation time and all of that. So I said, I knew if I if I left after that, after we got our bank, then they would have to pay me for all of that. So that's what I did. You know, was I ready? So what? You no. Know, you know, but that's that's what the situation came down to. So, you know, I left, and you know, by the grace of God, now I was I think I wasn't even out of work a month. It started with. Okay. Well, let me ask you this because I don't want you to um I don't want you you don't have to give so specifics. You know, we just having a conversation because I try to give some of this information to help people out. So I really try to stick to the facts of some stuff. But this for the this for the interview of what we do, we're gonna call you retired CO Rose, okay? So it this so it'll it'll be where you're speaking facts and it might help somebody, but we don't want to hurt nobody, okay? Sure. So CO Rose, I'm glad. <laughs> this is what I want to ask you. During your time, what years were you in the department? From 2004 to 2012. So that's considered eight years, right? In those eight years, like I said, we want to hear the nitty gritty. We want to hear, we want to hear stuff that probably could help. It might be somebody who's working there now, or you know, an inmate to be able to be able to deal with the opposite sex. You know, have you ever worked with men? I only work with men. I never worked with, with the females. So you always worked with men. Have you, you know, like I said, I'm going straight at you. You ever seen anybody try to pull that WAP out on you? All day, every day. They'll try it any chance they get. You said all day, every day. Oh, yeah, they'll try it any chance they get. So is it? But it would, like, they would try it. They would do it. And then, depending on how you responded to it, is if they would continue to do it or, you know, or wouldn't do it. And then the next person that will do would be a new, a new a new person to the house who don't know. And then they'll try to do it and then give her that same treatment. And then, you know, you wouldn't have that problem again. Oh, yeah, they would definitely try it. Definitely. Because there's always time, you know, the time when they will try to do it is always on, always on the count. You know, when you yell the count, you know, they know the truth that everybody needs to be, you know, everybody's post locked in. You know, you're on the count and I'm coming around, I'm on the count. We'll take your, take your, take your towels down. Take your covers down so I can look in the show, see a living, breathing body. Let me count and go about my business. And that would be the time, you know, that they would do it. And mm -hmm. I have my methods on how to how to um not ha not have it happen again, let's just say. Give me give me one. <laughs> well my my first favorite, like when I'm taking the count, I normally take the count with a piece of paper. And I'm using that piece of paper to get down anybody who might have been doing that, jerking off. So I'm walking, you know what I'm saying? I could do a quick walk and I and whoever's doing it. And like I said, you stay on the count. One, they can hear some female voice. Two, if a person is still doing it, they are purposely doing it. It's it's intentional. So you can't say that you didn't know that a female was walking. And that you, that, that you were on the count. Everybody knows when the count is, and we know what, what, how, is it, how it's done and when it's done. So if I'm walking, I'm taking the count, and I see you jerking off, my thing would be I would go in the bubble, I would get a little bucket, put warm water in it, and we always kept red food dye, you know, on coast. So I would get some warm water, put a few dots of red food dye inside the water. When I, after I finished my count, before my, the officer woman even would leave, I'm right back up to that cell, crack the door, take that bucket of water. And we also, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but we did. We would also keep a little bottle of piss. Somebody would always piss in a bottle. We always kept that bottle of piss. So it would be the warm water, a little bit of piss, and a few dots of red coloring to make it look like it was kind of like bloody water bloody pissy water, like one of us pissed in this, in this bucket, and that's what I would do, go inside the cell, and I would throw it on I'd be like, now you want to jerk off on me? Now, now I done threw some, some pissy ass, pissy ass piss on you, and I got my period. So now, hold that. Wow. I mean, I mean, it sounds horrible, 
but normally I wouldn't I wouldn't have that problem again. Of course, like I said, um, you know, you get your mates that come in that didn't know the routine because, you know, at that time, officers stayed with officers, the mates stayed with the mates. We didn't fight now. It wasn't no chit chat and it wasn't no no conversations like y'all did y'all thing and we did our thing. We stayed separate. So, you know, and that was pretty much that was one of my ways of not having that having that happen to me again. I know I know I wouldn't want to mess with you. <laughs> But let me ask you this, because like I said, we want the gritty and grimy, but I also want to give a message. What would you tell a CO female to a, to, 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 to give give some advice for, for a new female CO? That's right. Take a deep breath. Because <laughs> it's just so much. Okay. Um, if you wasn't popping out in the streets, out, out, as the mates like to say in New York, if you wasn't, if you if you wasn't getting hollered at in the streets, don't think you. It, if you wasn't popular or getting um, attention in the streets, when you come into the jail, believe you me, it's not real attention. You have to find know who you are and have your have your life outside of jail, because if not, you can get sucked in, and that's how that's how women get in trouble. You know, you start hearing all of this, you know, all the stuff that you're not hearing at home. You get into the jail system and then you hear all this stuff from somebody who got a, from an opportunist that has a lot of time and a lot of, you know, and got nothing else but time. And you start to believe it. So if you're, if your home life is stable, you're going to come to work and you won't want to get caught up. You know, you, they're not your friends. They, they're not your friends. You didn't come here to make friends. You came here to do a job. It's about care, custody, and control. You know? And that's what you have to keep it in front of your mind. Be yourself. Stop trying to be like everybody else. Don't try to follow nobody else. Just be yourself. You know, whoever that may be, because, you know, we're about the nice real. You know, and, you know, guys used to always say to me, oh, Miss Jones, I would, love to, I would love to see how you was in the street. Uh, nigga, the same way I'm in here now. Like, you ain't gonna find it. I, just, I, don't, I only know how to be me. You know, it's just like, you know, those little life lessons that you gotta take into, that you gotta take with you into work every day. Because if not, you'll get swallowed up. You so know, it's a different, it's a different ball game in there now because it's more like a shelter. It's more like, you know, get their social workers instead of, you know, mates and officers. So, you know, the, the, the climate is different now, but you know, those things will help, you know, um, help you survive and help you get through it. Cause it's not easy. You know, it's not easy. Like the people I, I went to, I came out with like, they're on their 18 year now. You know, everybody 24, um, February, February 12th, 2024, everybody, everybody I started with was retiring. You know, do I feel a little melancholy about it? Sure I do. Cause I would not have to be working after February 14th, you know, February 12th, 2024, but that wasn't my path. That wasn't what God chose for me. So, you know, it is what it is, but they're struggling. Cause I still talk to a lot of them. Well, let me, let me, let me ask you this, because like I said, I don't want you sometime to get too specific cause I'm just trying to teach and I don't want people to whatever. But what I want to ask you is this, if I'm a new inmate and I come inside your unit, right? How do you handle me? Do you give me any advice? Do you let the inmates deal with me? You know, when I was jailing, you, we did not, we didn't interact like that. We didn't give them nothing. They went in the house and either they found a, a group, whether it was race, whether it was gang, whether it was affiliation, whether it was, you know, whatever, whatever. They, they found their own little clicks and that's who they stuck with and the mates would tell them how the house ran. Okay, this is this is the slot time for the phone. This is when you feed and this is child time. This is the law library. This is when we go to rec. Like the inmates would do that. We didn't, we, we never, that wasn't our job. So let, was, let, let, me, let me ask you this. What is, what is slot time? Slot time for the phone. What is that? Me, meaning, Depending on how the house is ran, you know, different people, everybody had a time that they would get on the phone. Mm -hmm. So they would call the slot time. And they would tell, like, the new people would get, let's I don't know, the new people would get, like, um, 
maybe the last 40 minutes of the, of the, of the time before the phone turned off. And the, the guys who call themselves, you know, per se, with air quotes running the house, would get the, would get, you know, whatever time. Whatever time was convenient for them, like, I guess when their family was home or who could answer the phone, I, you know, that was how they, they figured it out. In my mind, like, and when I ran the house, I didn't care, like, as long as everybody used the phone, I don't care who, what time or whatever, as long as everybody used the phone. That was my thing. Have you ever seen anything happen over it? Have you ever seen anything, like, you know, I hear about stabbings over the phone. Have you ever been in any of that? Yeah, I mean, I, my, the worst, well, the the worst one I can remember, um, I don't know what it was over. And I mean, from what I can remember, I remember very clearly, um, at that time I was working in a bubble and a young girl who was, who was pretty kind of new, she was on the floor. So I'm in a bubble, but even though I'm in a bubble, I'm always looking like I'm always, um, the way, because the, the, the jail where I did most of my jailing was in the beacon on the island. So in the beacon, the way the bubbles are designed, you know, the bubbles are kind of up. And you can stand, like, literally in the middle of the bubble, you can look on both sides. You can see both sides. So you got you got 50 mates on both sides, 25 on top, 25 on the bottom. So you got 100 all together. So I can see, you know, just a quick glance, you can, like, kind of stand up and you can look to your left and you see one whole house, that's the A side, you can look to your right and you can see the other side. So I'm standing in the bubble and I'm looking, looking, all of a sudden, I don't see nobody. But I hear, but I hear, I hear sneakers, I hear, I hear, um, you know, squeaking. So now I walk to the, to the glass and I look over and all I can see is like hands moving. Can't see nothing but hands moving. So I tell the girl, get back out on that floor. And next thing you know, Homeboy is cut from the tip of his head all the way down to the crack of his ass. Wow. And, you know, once he's cut, you know, and it's so funny, I'll tell people, I've seen, like I said, I've seen that, I've seen people, you know, shot. I've seen, you know, brains blown. They don't shake me. But you give me something to stay, and I'm, 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 I'm going to throw up all over the place. But I remember that so clearly, and I'm, I'm looking, and I'm moving the guys out the way because I'm trying to get to it because I'm so fascinated, you know, also not scared, but like fascinated. I want to see, and I'm, you know, trying to assess everything, and I'm looking, and I was like, wow, look at this shit, and it was a whole big thing, you know. Now, because the young girl wasn't on the floor where she was supposed to be, she don't know who cut the boy. So now we got to figure out who cut her. So basically... I, I juice everybody up, meaning you get put all the inmates in the middle of the floor, and you put them in two lines, and you juice them up. You set everybody stands, so everybody got to take off their off they top shirt, only the t-shirt and their bottom. You know your jeans or whatever, but only a t-shirt. And I make everybody stand. Now, I learned this from, this from this old time had taught me this trick. She was like, anytime something happened, if you don't know who did it, do some up, take, make them take off their shirts, only, only, only have on t-shirts, and... I was standing, you know, just stand in line. You walk by, and you walk by, and just walk real slow and just look at them. And you look and see who's breathing the hardest, and that's going to be the person that probably did it. Wow. And that's what I did. I juiced them up and saw and this dude, like, you know, you, can, you couldn't, you, it's, it's, when that adrenaline is pumping like that, when you do something like that, you can't stop your breathing. Like, you can't stop the, the motion. So he was breathing all hard, and I'm like, mm hmm, okay. So now I tell her, listen, go to his cell and get all his, all his whatever food he got and bring it off the cell. So she was like, well, like, she didn't know what I was doing. I was like, just do what I told you. Go in the cell, get all his footwear, get a bucket or whatever and put it inside of a bucket and bring it out of the cell and take it to the bubble. And she did. And sure shit. Because he had time to take off the shirt. Like, when, when they cut him, he had time to, because, you know, the blood got on him. He had time to take off the shirt, um, change it. But there was sneaker prints. You could see, like, you know, because it, when you cut somebody, it's going to be blood. So he stepped in the blood. So it should only people that would have blood on their sneakers is the person who got cut or the person who did the cut. Mm -hmm. so ain't nobody going to be that close. Or you'll see a bunch of a bunch of footprints. I only saw, like, the two sets of footprints. So wow. I was like, all right, he had to go and change his sneaker. And sure shit, he had blood up under the pair of his sneakers. And he wanted to be rearrested for that. I think they gave him, like, Probably up like four or five years extra on his time. 
for that, for, for cutting that dude like that. Because he had cut him with a scalpel, I think it was. So then it was a whole big thing because we didn't get scalpels from him. We only get scalpels from the clinic. You know what I'm saying? Then the business was, was being looked at. It was a whole big thing behind that. But it was a big deal. Wow. Uh, that was like my biggest thing. Like I said, that old time taught me about that, that breathing hard thing, you know, with the t-shirts. And that's how I was able to figure out who cut the boy. Yeah. Like I said, I really appreciate you giving this because, like I said, you never know who your experience could help, you know? Mm -hmm. That's why I asked you some of this. And it's kind of hard. I know I know you said it twice already, but it's really kind of hard not to be specific because it's a very, it's, it's very specific. So it's kind of hard to speak in general, you know what I'm saying? Well, I'm just saying, when I say that, you know. yeah, when I say that, I mean, this as far as, with this certain names, you know, we just like to protect everybody because we just giving information to help people that might not know what you're saying and how to handle it. Right now, you're giving a, a CEO that might can hear this. Can, it can help her make a better decision and listen to somebody. You know what I mean? What you're saying right now might help somebody listen. But you know, I'm not letting you go because I want to know how, if, if you ever looked at one of them guys like, man, <laughs> like um, no only because I saw it too many times like I saw it up close and personal like chicks was getting in, ch chicks was, was bringing in food um, giving them doing whatever they was doing and watching them lose their job watching them lose everything I remember I was in the tomb because I went from I've, I've been in the few jails and my last stop was, was the tombs in Manhattan Manhattan house, and I never forgot to do mirror relief. And it used to be the chick I used to do mirror relief every day. And every day I would go and do the mirror relief. I would come to do the mirror relief. She would leave, she would leave the housing area for a maybe maybe they had a they had, at that time they had an hour. She would walk out that housing area. She would leave probably for like 10, 15 minutes. She would leave wherever she go wherever she went and come right back and back. All right, I'm back. I'm good. And I'd be like, uh, you sure? She'd be like, yeah. And then I would leave her side, go to the other side, do the mirror leave. And, you know, I always noticed that this dude would always be, you know, on the desk. Like, he'd always be talking to her, whatever, whatever. But you could hear the conversation, and, and the conversation wasn't abnormal, per se. But in my mind, she's too funny. Like, like you, you too chatty with these dudes. Like, that was my thing. You know, but that's just my opinion. So, okay, I didn't never say nothing. So as time went on, you know, I, like I said, I kept doing the mirror leave, doing the mirror leave. And I remember I came in to work one day. And IG was there, investigating. So when I come in and do, you know, come in, they be like, oh, Jones, you know, IG want to talk to you. And I'm looking around like, what they going to talk to me for? So I know I didn't do nothing. So I go in there, I'm like, you know, okay, what's up? So they ask me, oh, oh we noticed that from the law books, you do, you do this thousand areas of memories every day. Yeah. Have you noticed XYZ, ABC? And as soon as they said it, I was like, hmm. This bitch is fucking with that dude. That's the first thing I thought. Because why would you be asking me about that female? And I just told you, I've been doing that mirror release for a month. And she would do her routine with the same. And it would always be that same guy on that desk talking up. And when they asked me, did I notice anything? I said, well, I noticed that she talks to the, talks to the dude, but that's about it. Well, have you heard? I said, they don't talk about nothing from what I've heard um, out of the ordinary. You know, they just be, be chit-chatting. That was the end of that. Come to find out, not even a couple of months later, I didn't have this whole investigation. Why had they been tapping the phone? The dude, the, the housing area, the, the phone in the jail. How about the dude been calling her, like when she not at work, was calling her phone, talking to her. They done had this whole relationship, the whole nine. They found out about it, gave the girl a play, meaning didn't find her right on the spot. Why they transferred the girl to Rikers Island, transferred this guy to wherever they transferred him from. So they gave her a shot, told her, like, listen, don't have no more communication with him. Basically, she hadn't really done nothing at that point. She just was talking to him, which was a big no-no, but they, they gave her a shot. You know, that girl still went and started communicating with the guy again and wound up starting started sending him um, money and sending him whatever she was sending him. And while he got caught and then literally told on her, why did, why did he walk to out of that jail in handcuffs and the rest of her? Because wow. whatever she was doing, like whatever she started sending him or mailing him or whatever, it was a part of whatever case that he had going on. It was a whole big thing. And I just sat there and I looked, I was like, wow, look at this. Look at this. 
the girl messing with the dude. They gave her shot, and she still turned around and just wanted to be with him and, and, and lost her whole career behind it. Wow. Let me ask you this. I hear some of the stuff you're saying, but I want to ask you this. If you was ever to take that job again, would you do it? <sighs> With knowing what I know, no. Not because of how it is now, I wouldn't be able to. Listen, officers are doing triples. I know officers with over 20 years on the job and doing triples. That, 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 to me, that, I, that doesn't compete on my mind. I have a seniority, it does come with its perks. And at that point, once you have seniority, once you don't want to work overtime and once you do the eight and you want to escape, let me do my eight and let me go home. You got people with over 20 years doing triples. Mm -mm. I, would, I couldn't take that job. All right, that's you. What would you tell somebody else that was planning to become a CO? Would you give them any good advice? If they have, if they, they need a try. If you're going to take that job, especially if it's a, a woman with children, um... I'm going to say, not even a woman with children, if you're just a, a, a person with children, whether it's a man or a woman, you have to have a tribe because you have to have a backup to the backup to the backup in terms of your children, uh, their babysitting, you know, the needs, if you have parents that you're taking care of, pets, whatever, because that job is so unpredictable. You know, you, you, your, your life is not your own. Yeah, the money is, the money is good, but it comes at a cost. You know, and I, I always said the person who made the most money, who used to, who used to jail from CEOs, used to be this lady um, that was like two or three blocks from off the island. And she had a 24-hour um, babysitting. And when I tell you that woman made money hand over foot, because we used to take our kids there 24 hours. She was over 24 hours. She had a good setup running. She she, she made the most money out of anybody. Because you would pay. You, I mean, to have... You, you have to have a, you really have to have a support system if, you, if that's the job that you're planning on taking. Because nothing is, nothing is promised. It's a relief system. You are locked in. If they lock the jail down, where you going to go? Especially if you work on an island. You cannot even, I don't think people realize, we don't even, you don't even take your car onto the island. Your car is on the other side of the gate. So you leave your car in the parking lot, you have to come through a gate, and then you get on a bus, a literally a cheese bus, that takes you to your jail. So now let's just say they want to lock the jail down and, and, and nobody's leaving. And you here you go, I'm leaving, I fuck this shit, I'm going home. How, how, you, how you gonna get to your car? Cause there's no walking on the island. That's the part of the safety feature of the island. You will never see nobody walking on Rikers Island. That's a part of safety. Cause nobody walks, everybody's in the vehicle. So how you gonna get, how you gonna get from the, the building to your car? You can't walk. So, I mean, I would tell them I wouldn't. I would never deter nobody from getting their money and from making a career because it, it is a career. You know, you can make a very good living, but you have to have a support system. If you don't have a support system, you're gonna drown. You're gonna drown. Either that, or, or your kids are gonna be for the streets. The, 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 the streets are raising your kids. You L know, so listen. That's the only thing about it. Listen, like I said, Co Rose, I appreciate you. You know, you gave a lot of good information. And I might have to come back at you with a part two because you know I still got some goodies I want to ask you, but I ain't going to hold you up. I'm glad you took this time out and I want to thank you so much, all right? I'll talk to you later. No problem. You can say What's up, what's up, everybody? So there you got it, straight from the horse's mouth. It's a dangerous game from both sides, from the inmate side and from the CO side, even if it's a woman. So make sure you go get my book, Wild Bunch, The Dimensions of a Brownsville Millionaire, out now and on Amazon. And stay safe out there, stay safe out there, and go get that book, and stay out of jail.